Good morning. Let's all stand with you and let's worship the Lord. Condemned in darkness But your mercy brought new life And in your love and kindness Raised me up with Christ And made me righteous You have brought me back With the riches of your amazing grace And your endless love Lord, you are the light that broke the darkness. You satisfy my soul when I am heartless. If ever I forget my true identity, show me who I am and help me to and brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and the madness that made me alive forever with your life forever by grace I'm My sin has been erased I'll never be the same You have brought me back With the riches of Your amazing grace And relentless love Made alive forever With your life forever By your grace Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
Jesus, the only one could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Not that I've already attained all this or I've taken, uh, already made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Um, just kind of thinking, you know, this is the last Sunday of, of 2019. And I what what's an appropriate verse for that? You know, and I thought, well, yeah, you know, that is. Forgetting what is behind and straining and towards what is ahead and pressing on. Amen? Amen. Let's continue worship.
wandering from the fold of God, he to rest.
Christ. Oh, what a Savior is any wonderful. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a chapter, starting with verse 19, it says this, their destruction, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But here we go, here we go. Listen to this. But our, sin is, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will come like his glorious body. Our citizenship is where? Right. And as we look back at 19, and for good reason, we make things, hey, we did, I did this the other day with a group of guys. We, we got together, we said, let's, let's talk about 19. What happened in 19? What was good? What was bad? What do you want to change in 20? It was a neat time. We, we went around in a circle. It was a good thing to do. But in everything we do, when we look at 20, we've got to remember, this is not our home, right? We're only here. I, I, might, I might not lead worship next Sunday. Who knows? Who knows? You might not be here. Life is precious. We have a certain number of days, so we're supposed to live them. Let's live them for the Lord. Amen? Let's be better husbands, better wives, better dads, better friends. Amen? Come on, Terry, let's do it. Sometimes I feel 
feels like I'm watching from the outside. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing. But am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers. We're on here to find. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. So when the walls come falling down on me And when I'm lost in a current of a rage and sea I have this blessed assurance holding me All I know is I'm not home yet This is not where I belong Take this world and give me Jesus this is not where I belong the earth shakes wanna be found in you when the lights fade wanna be found in you Continue worship. Turn around and, and say this hi to somebody. Somebody, hey, you're looking good today. Good morning, South Point Church. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been preparing all week and are so excited that we get to spend this Sunday morning together. If you need any information about who we are and what we do here at South Point, do us a favor. Drop by the Yes table after service. Our friendly volunteers would love to get to know you. As you find your seat, please take a look at what we've got planned for you in the coming weeks. Pastor Appreciation Sunday was a huge success and you still have an opportunity to bless your pastors with gifts. Personal gifts can be labeled with the name of the pastor you would like to give it to and can be placed in the offering basket or dropped off at the yes table after service. And be sure to sign up for 365 days of prayer so we can bless Pastor Keith with prayers of love and encouragement throughout 2020. Inserted in your program today is South Point's membership covenant. For those of you that have gotten to know us this past year and are looking to take the next step, consider becoming a member here at South Point and permanently becoming a part of our church family. There are a few biblical requirements, so take a look at the membership covenant as we all prepare our hearts and minds looking forward to Membership Sunday coming up in January. Well, good morning, South Point. Bienvenidos. <laughs> How are you? All right, well, we're going to do our memory verse this morning in English and then in Espanol. Uh, we will make, say, the address, the verse and the address. So in English, we will start with the address. First Thessalonians 5.11. 
Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. First Thessalonians 5.11-ish. Buenos dias, good morning. Ooh, that sounds better. Are you guys happy that it's almost New Year? So it's uh, Primera Thessalonians 5.11. Por lo cual, animaos unos a otros y edificaos unos a otros así como lo haces primera tesalonenses 5.11 and everybody said man Good morning. How are you? Good. Well, I just want to tell you how excited I am to be with you this morning. It's, I usually feel excited about being in church today, but for some reason, today more than many days, I sure am excited to be here with you. So thank you for being here. New friends and visitors and people who have been here for a long time. I'm Pastor Brian. I'm one of the teaching pastors. What my wife Claudia didn't say is who she was when she was up here doing the memory verse. So, hey, she goes like this. So, well, here we are. It's the, uh, the last weekend, the last Sunday of 2019, like Kurt said. And that's something else. So, so we made it. We made it through 2019, right? So give yourself a hand for making it. Okay. And now that you're here, just relax. Take a deep breath. We made it. Good job. All right. Well, uh, so you know that the theme for this year, uh, 2019, has been building. And, uh, and the Lord has been teaching us a lot about building. Um, he's been teaching us about building in a literal sense, right? Because this stage is only, it's not even a year old yet. We started this in 2019. Isn't this a great project? It came out really neat, and the Lord has blessed us with that. So, um, and everyone's put time into that. Thank you. It's been great. And the Lord's been blessing us, talking to us about building message-wise. All the messages have been geared towards building, and it's been something that has been Good. I went back and I looked at a list of all the messages, all the titles for 2019 uh, about building, and I'm telling you, there was a lot of good stuff that uh, we had heard. We'd heard about stuff about building our faith, building our marriage, building our forgiveness, building our understanding of adoption, building our understanding and deepening in Jesus Christ. There's just been a lot of stuff. The one thing I took away when I checked that is, do you realize what a big deal it is when God says to a people, a place like this, I'm going to build you. I'm going to take a year, and I'm going to work on you, work on us. Do you know what that says to me? That says to me his sense of value, evaluation of us. And I can't tell you what a big deal that is. Well, I could tell you what a big deal that is. I am telling you what a big deal that is. Is when God says to his people, when God says to his people, I love you so much that I don't want you to be in the way you used to be. I don't want you to live the way you have always lived. I want to encourage you. I want to lead you. I don't want to just have you say, I guess i got to figure this out. But rather, I want to come alongside you. I want to scooch up next to you and say, Honey, there's something in this life with me that I want with you. And that's what that means, that he would take a whole year of building uh, for us. And, and I'm really been a, I've been eating on that for a little bit. So today we're going to talk about a year of building, putting it all together. And my attempt today will be to put a little thread around the year, pull it tight, and see if we can't uh, tie it all up and get ready for 2019, 2020, sorry. You all got a bulletin when you came in, so um, we're going to use that. Uh, and our text today is going to be Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. So let's go ahead and, and begin reading. It's on your... On your um, bulletin there, your program, and it says, therefore I urge you, pause, whenever the Bible talks about therefore, it's really important, it's really important because the therefore, whatever the author is going to say, is based on what he's already said, therefore, 
And so it's really important for that fact. So whenever you get to a therefore, you always pause and go, now wait a minute, why is that here? We always ask that question. What's the therefore? Therefore. Because there's always something important. It's not what the fact is in the moment. It's based on what, uh, what has been said. I'm going to come back to that. That's an important point. Okay. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable form of worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And our outline, if you look at your program, our outline today will be, God builds us because of who we are. God builds us as we cooperate. God builds us, excuse me, God only builds, he never remodels, and God only builds, builds new construction. All right? So let's get started. God builds us because of who we are. Right. So question for you, question for me, do you know who you are? Of course we know who we are. Uh, so maybe the better question is, is do you actually know how valuable you are to God? That might be one of the more important questions that we'll ask ourselves this morning. So in Romans 12:1. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. So when Paul gets to this passage, he starts in the middle of a thought. Right? He doesn't start at the beginning of his thought because everything Paul's going to say from this point will be based on what he has just got done saying. Okay, now, what you need to realize is, is right here where he's speaking, what he's going to say is based on not just the last sentence he wrote or the last paragraph he wrote, He's going to base what he's going to say now, what we're going to talk about, based on 11 whole chapters. That's where we come into this point where Paul makes this statement. 11 whole chapters. Uh, so it's a lot that he's going to say, therefore, too. Now let me remind us that we're speaking about the book of Romans. Okay? And the book of Romans is one of the most important books that we have in the scriptures. The reason for that is because in hardly any of it, Paul was not actually trying to address problems in the church. He was not trying to bring forth doctrinal things. He was not trying to do a lot of stuff that was just tactical, that was just logistical, just touching a church. His main message in the book of Romans was he was speaking about you. He was speaking about me. So for 11 whole chapters in this magnificent book, he's talking about you. He's talking about your new born-again life in Christ, its nature, it, what you're like now that you've been born again. That's what he's speaking about. Um, so let me just take a, a quick second to just kind of uh, give you an idea of the topics that he hit. So when he talked about you, he talks about how you were made right with God by faith and not by works. He talked about the spiritual reality, you could even say the physical reality, of your new birth in Christ. He talked about the nature of that new person living inside of you, that born-again man. He explained that very deeply. Uh, he talked about how we're dead to our old self and made alive to, to Christ in our new self. Um, he talked about how this new nature fights and wars against the old nature. And he talks about how, his, um, how Christ himself supports that new that new man that's been born again in us, your new life, how Christ himself supports that. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, and it's thick reading. And if you ever think to go back to it, I would encourage you to because it's, real, it's, it's foundational, it's excellent. But I want to pull out one thing that's probably the most relevant and succinct portion of Scripture, and perhaps all of Scripture, where, that speaks about how God sees us, right? So when I ask the question, who, you know, who are you? Do you know how valuable you are? Well, we're going to read right now that this is probably one of the most succinct places where God says, let me tell you what I think. Let me tell you how I see you. And that's found in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. And it says this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, 
but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. That's what we cry out. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed you suffer, we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. So in this passage, um, Paul talks to us about the idea that we're children and we're heirs and we're co-heirs or fellow heirs. So what does that mean? We're children. It's significant to note that when this is said, it's not a reckoning of how we figure ourselves. It says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirits. God himself says, you're my child. I'm calling you my baby. There's no assumption in that. He directly says, I call you my child. It's important to note that he didn't say, I call you my servant. I call you my little army of God. I call you my house guest. I call you my, now if you have a good day, then maybe we'll call it good. He doesn't call us that. I call you, I see you as my baby who's adopted. I, not, just, not just, hey, that's my blood child. It's, there's a sea of people here, and I want that one. And that one was you. Name your name. That's you. And he says, I want you. That's to be a child of God. The next thing he talks about is an heir. We are heirs of God. Well, that's easy. You know, everything that God has is our inheritance. Right? We get, we get treasures when we get there, crowns when we get there. We get to go to heaven forever and ever and be with Jesus. And, and that's all wonderful. So, so that's easy. We get that part. And the last thing he says is we're co-heirs or fellow heirs with Christ. Now, what does that mean? Co-heirs with Christ. Well, what that means is we have the same relational position with God as what Christ has with God. Now, let me explain this to you. Let me, let me share what this means. That's as though to say... Let's say you have a room here, and you got your door, okay? And inside this room, God and Jesus, and they're talking. That makes perfect sense to us. I'm God, you're Jesus, and you have this special connection. You have a special relationship. And when God and Jesus talk together, they talk in hushed tones. They talk in, in tones that are like intimate, like deep friends, like, like there should be no separation between the two of them. And that's what we expect. That's how we would anticipate them talking. It's Jesus. Of course he has a good relationship with God. And then there we are outside the door. And we say, man, I sure would like to talk to God. Have I, what have, I, have I done good today? Have I, you know, did I, did I sin? Is there something that keeps me from knowing God? Uh, boy, that's, I just, well, maybe if I knock, maybe, but I don't want to disturb them. Jesus is inside with his hushed tones and he turns and he sees you. He sees me. And he says, there you are. Come here. Come here. I want you to be here. Your place is here with my father and I. This is your place. We are co-heirs. We are fellow heirs. If my place is with God, your place is with God. Because that's who we are. He calls us that. That intimate place is the three of us. There's no, please, sir, may I have some more? It's not that. It's you belong here. If I belong here, you belong here. Talk to him. Talk to your father. And we'll talk and speak in intimate terms together. That's what that means. And that's what God calls us. So in that example, there are no performance qualifiers. There's no exclusions in any of that. Those feelings that I feel and I struggle with regularly of unworthiness, Guilt of shame, they don't play into that equation because of the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't play into that equation. That's my deal. That's not his. His invitation is so there, open all the time. So his relationship with us is only because we are born again. We are saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we belong there. Okay? So all that is to say, that's a, a scriptural fact. That's a that's a fact that none of us can argue with. It's a done deal. I don't even care what we think about it. When we know Jesus Christ and we know God, that's what it is. Okay. The problem lies in us 
understanding that. And us not just understanding that, but believing it and accepting that. So when we have that struggle of God loves me just because of who I am versus God's love is influenced by how I perform or did I do good today or did I sin or how did I treat my wife or how did I treat my husband? What that is, is that's our old nature struggling with our new nature. There's a clash. They don't understand each other. They don't talk the same language. They always clash. And inside of you, inside of me daily, there's that clash. The full acceptance, but I don't feel worthy. Clash. Clash. And we have to overcome that. Building, that's part of what God builds in us through this last year, is the understanding that there is a clash. So when we first gave our lives to Jesus, and maybe you're like me, you first gave your life to Jesus, and there was just this closeness. I felt clean. I felt washed. I felt connected. I felt loved. I felt belonged. I felt, I felt like I belonged, not belonged. I felt like I belonged. And it was wonderful. Do you know what that is? That's one of the first works of grace that God has ever done for us. We experience Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. And when we experience that sensation of whole cleanness and whole acceptance, that is a work of grace. Thank you, God. I am a recipient of that grace. And the confusion now that we experience between who I am and how I perform is actually, it's a spiritual struggle. It's not a natural struggle. It's what we experience in our, in our um, spirit. I'll point to my own, I'll point to my own uh, experience as an example, because as long as I've been walking with the Lord, so we're talking 30 some odd years, I've been walking with the Lord. I know, right? I'm old. Uh, I've been walking with the Lord, and I've always experienced this tension, this tension about being fully accepted but not performing correctly or doing well enough. And, and there's been no cessation of that. There's been a, a minimizing of that the more I get to know Jesus, but there's never been an actual sen- sus- a, a stopping of that. It's always been there. And so I say, when God says, but I love you, and I say, but I know that. I know where it says it in the Bible. I, I know and I'll tell anyone that God loves us and, I, and that I'm fully accepted and, and that's just a given fact. So why is it that inside I still feel that struggle, that insecurity deep down? It's still there. Even though I can tell you chapter and verse that God loves me. And, and when my kids are young and I'll say God loves you and all this stuff, but still, why is it that I have that deficit inside of me? But why do I still feel that lack inside of me? I liken it like an iceberg. And and so in an iceberg, you get that little bit on top, out of the water, and you get the whole bit underneath the water. And the little bit on top is the part of me that says, but I know that God loves me. And I know that I'm well-valued. I know that. And then you have the whole bit underneath the water that says, oh my goodness, I sure hope that's true. That's my... That's my belief system. I know that, but the rest of my belief system has to catch up with that. And that's the struggle that we experience. That's the, one of the difficulties that God has to build out. So as God convinces the whole part under the water, my belief system, what the head knows, and that's really what happens over the course of our life, is there's that, that connection point between what the head knows and what the belief system wants to know that's building. I don't know if any of us ever on this side of heaven actually overcome that, but that's his part of building that he does. The, the, when he begins taking out that performance bit and says, wait a minute, remember the blood, remember the cross. Okay? And that takes time. If I'm any, then I'm not normalizing of anything, but in 30 years, you know, and I've had a good diet of Bible and, and stuff, and I know as much as any, well, no, I don't. <laughs> Some of you are pretty darn smart. But I've been walking with him for a long time and I've had a lot of experience with him. And I still struggle. It takes time, honey. It takes time, sweet one. And he'll do it. It's part of his building work. Okay? So God building is an act of love for who we are. That's that point. Who you are, he loves. So he'll take a year of building it. 
He'll take your lifetime of establishing it. He'll do all that stuff because of who we are. All right? Okay, point two. God builds us as, he, as we cooperate. God builds us as we cooperate. Now lean in close. Let me whisper a little secret to you. Lean in close. God's work doesn't just happen because he wants it to. God's work happens as fully comes forth as we cooperate with him. Did you get that? There's this cooperation point that God um, has with us in his working in him. It says, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable form of worship. Okay, so this, rela- this, this passage talks about now our cooperation point. The po- what's your part? What do we do? And it's a, it's a part where it cooperates. And it breaks it down in three ways, okay? That we cooperate in view of God's mercy. Okay, now get this. That whenever God's doing a work and we get a chance to do something with him or in it and we cooperate, it's always in response to. It should never start out as I'm the prompter of that. I'm the one who starts that work or says, I want you to do this. Almost always in my experience, he says, I want something for you, for you and me. And then all I do is say, yes, I want it too. And then there's a response back. Okay, cooperation is responsive. Next part it says is offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, and what that tells us is offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The act of cooperation only happens as we offer ourselves to him. Not before, not just because, but as we offer ourselves to him. Okay, and what's a living sacrifice anyway? What is that all about? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is a sacrifice that's alive. Go figure. (laughs) Okay. What that means is our understanding of sacrifice is that we kill something and give it to God. But a living sacrifice is we offer something alive to God. Some of us have grown up and we've lived with the idea that God's happy when I clean up my act, when I stop doing bad stuff, when I stop sinning, then that makes God happy. Do you realize that as a living sacrifice, that's not actually what makes God happy. That's not what he's aiming at. Jesus Christ is actually aiming at at a life that's fully given over to him that he can begin working in. And from that point, then his life starts flowing through us, out of us. That's what a living sacrifice is. He works within us, And that overflow works out of us, a living sacrifice. I want to be that, Lord. I want to give myself to you for that. Do your work in me. Please, God, do your work in me. So there will be an overflow that others can experience that. A living sacrifice. And do you know what that speaks of? Cooperation. He has a part, and I have a part. Silly example uh, of that is losing weight. Is anyone going to try and lose weight in 2020? <laughs> Maybe some of us should. But so that's a, that's a silly example. But losing weight is a great example of cooperation. God, my blood pressure is up, my cholesterol is up, my knees hurt, my back hurts, my hemorrhoids hurt, my toes hurt, all of me hurts. Help me. Heal me. Save me. Let your Holy Spirit heal and redeem. And God would say, yes, I want to. And I'm going to. But I'm going to heal all of you. Not just your symptoms. He cares about the whole self. And as we cooperate, as He says, and here's what you do, And as we start to do it, then he says, and on top of that, I'm going to throw in the cholesterol numbers. I'm going to throw in the blood pressure. I'm going to throw in all that stuff. Because we're not just dealing with symptoms. We're dealing with the whole you. And don't you know, that that's what God loves, is the whole us. 
So more than God wants to fix our problems, he cares about all of us because we're not followers of God. I'm here to tell you, you're not a follower of God. You're the family of God. You're children of God. You're heirs of God. You're co-heirs of God. Co-heirs with God. This is our place. This is our place. And he said, you're my friends. Do you get that? You're not servants. We're not just optional. We're family. We're friends. We're children. And because of that, because of that, he'll snuggle up on next to us. And he'll say, sweetie, let's do this together. I want to do it with you. I want to cooperate with you, and I want you to cooperate with me. Because that's how his work gets done. Do you remember that in Psalms, chapter 40, verses 6 through 8, there's that great passage, and it says this. I've abbreviated it just a little bit. It says, sacrifice a meal offering you've not desired. What can I do for you? That's not what I care about. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. How can I like, like do something that's productive? And That's not what my heart is for you. Then I said, behold, I come. And in the scroll of your book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will. This was prophetic of Jesus Christ himself. And he said, I delight to cooperate with you. I delight to do your will as you've set forth. I want to cooperate. Because you're in my heart, I'm in your heart, and I want to be in your in my heart. So God doesn't want us to do, do, do Christian stuff. He wants us to live deeply with him. He wants to live lives that are built and are healed. Point three. God only builds, he never remodels. So here's we pick up in the passage. It says, and do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God never wants to rebuild stuff. He never wants to repackage things and um, rework things and call it, hey, new and improved, or hey, this is easier. He always wants to start things fresh. Um, do you know that the word, when it says, do not be conformed, or do not conform to the pattern of this world, what that word conform means is, do not remain the same, or do not be more like you used to be. So if we take that definition, and we slap that now in the verse, what it tells us is, do not remain the same as the pattern of this world. I want to build you. Or it says, do not become more like the pattern of this world. I want to build you. I want to build that out. And not just, not just the pattern of this world, but how about the pattern of your old person? What about who Brian used to be? Don't be conformed to the pattern of what Brian used to be. Well, he's talking about the flesh. Whatever that is before we came to Jesus Christ is flesh, and it's designed to die off, not to be reworked, not to be repackaged, not to like be renewed or redeemed. It's to die. All of our old patterns, our styles of, of coping, our old self, old operating systems, desires, affections, hurts, fears, messages, Insecurity, lies, logic, beliefs, all of those, as we come to know Jesus, are to be dying away. He's not rebuilding them. He's not redeeming those. He's killing those off. The problem with that is it's painful. You know what? It hurts. It's a painful process. But it's the only way God can position us in such a way to where he can build. Do you get that? He wants to build, but there's a bit of dying that has to happen because he's not going to repackage. He's not going to rework. He's not going to remodel. It has to die. One of the biggest problems is, I like it. It's me. My old pattern is familiar to me. It's comfortable to me. Hey, it's just who I am. Just keeping it real. Just being, you know, one of the guys. Just who I've always been. So our inclination, because we so desire it, we're so accustomed 
to our old self. The old patterns that he wants to not remodel but kill off. Um, we're so accustomed of it, accustomed with it, then our first inclination is, I'll just slap some paint on it. I'll just put a new carpet in. I'll just um, uh, clean it up a bit. And then it'll be okay. It'll be all right, right, God? We'll just stop doing a bunch of ugly stuff and I'll be cool. But that's not how it works. Rather, the process works more like this. So let's say, let's say here, before you were born, you were on God's drafting table. He had this work that he was working up, and boy, it was going to be magnificent. It was going to be wonderful. And he's drawing it out, and he's saying, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to put that in there. And that thing that he drew out, the blueprint he drew out, is you. It's me. It's my Brian. And he's drawing that out, and he goes, oh, that's one of the best things I've ever done. It's what he thinks about you. It's one of the best things I've ever done. Oh, mind blown. Because that's how good it is. That's what his intent was for us, for each one of you, for each, for each one of me, <laughs> for me. Okay, so then what happens? We're born. And we're born into sin, and we know that's how it works. And we are, we're put into a family, and sin happens to us, and hardening happens to us and abuse happens to us, and neglect happens to us, and unmentionable things happen to us. That's the sin of this world. That's not God. That's ugliness of Satan himself. That's how he wants to destroy mankind. That's how he wants to destroy our relationship with God, by how destructive and nasty and angry and ugly he is. We're tainted by that. So then we, then we get saved. Then we're born again. I always wanted you back. That was the plan, God says, for you to be born again, for you to come back into the, into the fold, into my family. And God, and he sees you when you're born, he goes, wait a minute, I love you, that's wonderful, but wait, this is not that, that's not who I designed. I made this magnificent, this opus of everything I am, but that's not this. So what, did he, what does he have to do? He has to begin changing us to look more like what he originally designed. But now when he changes us, that's where it hurts. He has to start taking off these things that have been bolted on the side and, and those rotted parts and, and, and those hurt parts and those, those insecurities we've thrown up and those coping mechanisms we've thrown up and those, um, uh, that pride and that stuff that's become part of us. And he has to start stripping that off, start taking it off because his design was not that, but he needs to get that to be this, which brings us to our last point, and that is God only builds new construction. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when he's in the process of take, doing this painful thing of taking off what's not right out of that, out of you, out of his masterpiece, the point is not to hurt you. The point is not to destroy you. The point is not to make you unhappy. The point is not to let you enjoy life. The point is because I want to turn you into what I've made, what I designed you on paper to be the entire time, and I can't get there until I take you apart. And then we're going to transform you into this. You're a beautiful thing, and he's going to transform you back into this. Okay? Another way to think about this is a polywog, a tadpole. Because the word transform, believe it or not, is to be changed into something that has never been before. Brand new. It's never existed. If you transformed, he'd never remake stuff. He makes it brand new. It's never existed. And do you know that's what a polywog is? When it's born, it's no bigger than a... Uh, watermelon seed with a little tail and it swims around. It has gills. You can see little slits in its face and it swims around in its muddy, little mucky mud puddle and you never know it exists. And there it goes and it's swimming around, swimming around, bumping against things. It doesn't even have eyes yet and it's bumping up against things. But this transforming process begins to happen. And you know this is true. We all played with our polywogs. Um, it's swimming around, and it starts growing these things off to the side, these flipper things off to the side. Well, that's weird. And then got a few more that start coming out the back. Well, that's really odd. And the tail starts going away. It's changing. 
and it doesn't breathe like it used to. It can't get a full gill of water to... Now it's not it's satisfying. It starts to choke on itself until finally it gets close to the surface and it's really weird and awkward and it gets close to the surface and it sticks his little face up and he goes, <gasps> air. And this is cool. I got air now. And he takes his flipper and puts it outside of the water and he crawls himself out and sure enough he grows legs and now he can hop around. You know what would happen to that? He was transformed. It had never existed before. And that's what God is doing in us. We're transforming from a, that life of sin. He's building that in us. That life of sin, that life of what we used to be, into something that's beautiful, into a wonderful frog. Welcome, wonderful frog. You've heard of thug's life? We're going to call it the polywog life. You don't choose it, it chooses you. So let me tell you something about my experience. Um, so in my family, speaking of the transformative, speaking of how God builds, um, in my experience, my family, you don't know me um, well enough to know this, but my family that I come from, my family of origin, is extremely sarcastic. That's how we cut our teeth, and not in a nice way either. We cut as, um, as a recreation thing. But it's not because... We want to hurt you, we cut because we have to feel good about ourselves. For us to feel good about ourselves, then we need to ensure that you're cut down a little lower so I can stand a little higher. Insecurity, really. That's where I come from. That's what the men in my family do. And we're good at it. We're clever. You see us on the street, oh yeah, we're cool, we're clever. That's where the Nagel men come from. And that's what I lived in. My brother, my father, my other brother, all of us. And at some point, that wasn't so long ago, well, it was a little while ago, at some point, the Lord says to me, um, we need to change that. That's not what I want for you. That was not the design. That was not part of the blueprint. And, and he said that by saying, I want you to love your wife. Don't cut her any longer. In fact, don't say anything except, I love you, and affirm that. Say yes, and no cut to it. Say no with no cut to it. Be sincere, Brian. The laughing is my wife because she can attest to this. Be sincere, Brian. Okay, that's great. So we say, oh yeah, Brian, that's wonderful, that's good. But I'm telling you, the difficult part of that is because in the transformation process between what my entire existence has been Everything that my life was shaped around was this thing. And God says, I don't want you like that now. I want you to be like this thing. And the transition between it is a difficult transition because now, as you're moving from one to the other, uh, you lose a sense of your own identity. There's a sense of, well, who am I if I'm not sarcastic? I'm blank. I'm just sort of nothing. And that's really how I felt. It was really disappointing to me because I'm like, but God, now, I'm pretty cute and clever and, and guys like me and all that stuff and now they won't even like me anymore. Do you like me? Someone said no. <laughs> it's beautiful. What God is doing is a beautiful thing and you will never miss what wasn't. You will love what is. And when God builds us in this year of building, as he transforms us and renews us into something that hasn't happened, go along with it. As painful as it is, as disappointing as it is, as unaccustomed as we are to it, we have to cooperate with it and go along with it. That's the only way that his work happens. Okay? But it's not easy. It's not simple. And, and people outside won't necessarily go, hey, that's really, in, that's really deep what you're doing. They won't say it like that. You'll know it, though. You'll feel every bit of it. Because it's so unsettling. It's, it's depressive. Not because I'm a depressed person, but because I have no nothing I can now, there's no foundation any longer. I'm walking around like I, I don't know what these things are. Because I'm changing. I'm transforming. So as a new man is being built, as a new man is being renewed into God's image, 
um, as he wants to continue that work, our job is to give it expression. Allow it to happen. When you want to do good, when I want to do good, when I never did, do that. Oh, I'm not being true to myself. That's not what I would do. Try it. Maybe the Holy Spirit's in you saying, I want you to do this for that person. Well, that's not what we do. Try it. Let it have its voice. Let it have its expression. Brian, speak sincerely to someone. Look in their face and tell them how wonderful they are. Look how wonderful you are. I'm telling you, you're pretty special. Give it voice. Give it expression. We're not generous people. My family's not generous people. We pinch pennies and try giving. Give expression to that. And Claudia is a great coach on that, so if you ever need coach on giving, ask her. Okay. Be generous. Be gentle for once. Well, I was wrong. I know you were wrong. But try giving a gentle word back. Try not defending yourself. Well, that's not right. That's not fair. I know. And do you remember what Tommy Lee Jones said in The Fugitive? When he said, when Richard says, I didn't kill my wife, he said, I don't care. Not to be too cute about it, but Jesus says, be like I want you to be and say it at some point, I don't care, I'll, I'll give up my rights, I'll give up who I am, because Jesus is that important. And that's how much of value he's placed on us in 2019 that he's set us aside for a building work. The last thing I'll say is this. Um, our passage says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? We can interpret the things that God's been teaching us in 2019 as that renewal, the fodder, the, the firewood for that to happen as our minds and hearts are renewed. We had wonderful teachings. We had wonder as God's doing a wonderful work in us. That's the that's the the bedrock. That's the base when He wants to renew our mind. That's what He's going to start working out of. That's when He's going to start using. That's why we listen. That's why we we come here on Sundays. That's why we're in fellowship because that's what He's going to use to build us. Okay, so He uses the Word, and if you're not reading the Word, brother, sister, get into the Word. We have Facebook feeds here if you like to listen to Pastor Keith. Um, there's audio Bibles. There's tons of way to get the Word in you. And when you get into the Word, it's a tool that renews your mind. Okay? Do you worship? Well, I worship when I come to Sunday. Well, worship in your home. Turn off the internet, turn off the newspaper, turn off the radio, and worship. In your car, turn off the radio. Worship. Why? Because that's a tool that renews the heart. Right? Our passage is by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your heart. Do you pray? Pray more. Why? Because it renews a closeness with God. It renews that. It fosters that. Do you fellowship? Yeah, we get around every so often. Do it more. Because it renews a closeness with each other. Do you serve? Yeah, I serve every so often. Do it more. Go out of your way in the grocery store. Let people cut in front of you in line. Do, all, do it. Do it. Because it renews your love for others. Renews. Are you a giver? Yeah? Give more. I don't say that selfishly either. Either, Give more because it renews your sense of living for more than just, what's, who, than just yourself. Live beyond people. All those things, none of those things are an end unto itself. The Christian disciplines, I read the Bible, I pray, I worship, oh, I'm doing something. It's not an end unto itself. It's those are the building blocks that the renewing of your mind, that the transformation happens from. If you have these things in place, worship, the word, fellowship, prayer, giving, serving, now God has something to work with. He's got something inside that now he can actually resource. You see how that works? It's not an end to itself. It's because he's actually going somewhere. He wants to transform our lives into his image. He wants to build. So at the end of the year, we're at the end of the year, and we're at the end of our theme. Building is done as of today. Um, but I want to tell you something, and I'm sure you know, God's never actually done building. Do you know that? He's never actually done building because he loves us too much. He's invested too much. 
You know what he invested? His son, his blood, the cross, the resurrection, the entire universe pretty much. And he's never done doing it. Until the day you draw your last breath, that's when he's done. And I go home and see Jesus. Done. Race well run. Okay, But until that day, listen to him because he never stops. Okay, That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves us. That's the commitment he has for us. All right. So um, take everything off your laps, please. Everything out of your hands. Do you want that work to continue in you? I do too. I do too. So I like us to cooperate with the Lord. And as odd as this sounds, I'd like us to have a heart that gives him permission to work. And I don't mean that like God has to do what we say, we give him permission. But what I mean by that is a surrendering permission that says, God, you're working and you love me. And now I'm going to turn, in fact, turn your palm side up like this to the Lord. And close your eyes, please bow your heads. And I want you to say to God, I give you permission to do your work of building in me. Say that in your hearts. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you've heard God say anything to you today, anything at all in the littlest or in a large way, I want you to say verbally, I hear you, Lord. And what you just did is now you will cooperate with him. That's what that is. That's why we turn our palms up. That's why we express back. It's a cooperation with God. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I pray for us in 2019, 2020, that Holy Spirit, the work that you've done in us would not never be done. Build. We invite you. We ask you to complete a work that you've already done. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it to the end. Do that, Lord. We give you permission. We give you permission. Keep your eyes closed and your heads down, but put your hands down. And I want to speak to anyone who maybe is here and you've never accepted the Lord before. You heard what was shared and you go, you know what? I want that. Uh, th there's something there that I feel the call of God. And I want to give you opportunity. And if you've never accepted the Lord into your hearts, you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. There's no one looking around. I'd like you to lift your head and raise your hand and just look at me. And give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. He said yes to you, and now we would say yes back to him. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Well, everyone look this way. Good. Oops. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you for coming out to church. Um, ushers, would you please come forward? We're going to take the offering now. Um, ex extend your worship into offering, the giving of your, of your hearts and of your resource. They're going to come by. Remember that uh, we have the kiosk um, that we can give through or the website you can give um, your offerings to. Um, so that if you're here for the very first time, there's a white card in the back of the seat. Thank you for coming, by the way. Pull that white card out. Just put down your name and uh, let us know that you're here for the first time. We'd love to say hi to you and, and see if there's anything we can do for you. All right. Hey. Love you, Danny. You're one of the best guys I know, man. And see, he comes in my office every almost every day and we talk. What a beautiful man he is. Okay, so uh, if you're a pastoral, part of the prayer team, uh, please make your way forward. Begin moving this way now and spread out. Is there anything in the end of 2019 that you'd like to sh talk with the pastor with or part of the prayer team, have them pray and agree with you with? We're available for that. And as the offering is ending, we'd like to pray and let us out of here. So Jesus, thank you so much for your work in us. Thank you so much for loving us and bringing us in. And as you do your work, we would ask you to, to continue it. Keep us safe as we go. Safe 2000. Uh, uh, 19 to 20 New Year, Lord, and, uh, um, and let our hearts be renewed in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you're dismissed. We'll see you next year. Uh.